Your MC today is Olena Hugh. Olena is an award-winning TV personality, reporter, and news anchor. The Kauai native and former Miss Hawaii is the founder of an international marketing and communications firm, and she produces and stars in The Best Hawaii, a TV show and podcast on Hawaiian telecom and in flight on Hawaiian Airlines. Olena is an active in the community, including being an advocate for breast cancer prevention. Please welcome to the stage, Olena Hugh. Hi everybody, happy Aloha Friday. Great to see everyone. Look at these beautiful people. Thank you for turning your camera on. We have a great day filled with guest speakers, fun, engagement, and terrific sponsors and exhibitors. And we're going to end with a virtual Palhana. We'll have round tables and networking on the Remo platform where you can video chat with your friends and colleagues. Now this morning we're coming to you live from the Anthology Group office here at Bishop Square. And today our general session speakers will be with us here live in studio as well. We have a great AV crew in studio. Take a look at them. Yay! <laughs> they are doing a great job and putting this together very well, so thank you guys. So we have virtual producers in Seattle and Chicago, and if at any point in the day you have a problem with your tech, send an email to sherm at shermhawaii.org for an email. Now get out your swag box. I'm going to go over all the wonderful things that you have, and we're going to thank all of our platinum sponsors. And we've got some great swag. As you can see, the theme for this year is HR stands for Honoring Relationships. I love that, don't you? Now we know HR can get kind of hectic, so you can place these items around your workspace to remind you to honor relationships. So if your laptop is getting a lot of use these days, you can do something special for it. Hug it with this Island Energy laptop sleeve. Isn't it beautiful? And as you can see, it says Honoring Relationships right there. Good reminder. Also, uh, being an HR, you might need a moment of zen. We also have this Ceridian air plant where you can take a deep breath, relax, look at it. You know, it's an air plant, so it might remind you to breathe deeply, take in all that air. On the other hand, when you need the law firm of Torkelson Cats, they'll eat up the lunch of your opponents. That's why they gave you this lunch box. Super cute, durable, and I also thought that this could also serve as a small cutting board. <laughs> but here's a look inside, and that is nice and airtight as well. And everybody, do you have your UKG mug? Hold it up for me if you do. I'm watching, there we go. Good job, Christina. All right, well, it's a great way to remind you that HR stands for honoring relationships, and it's nice, good size. You have lots of great ideas today as well, and Pro Service Hawaii has provided this really cute notebook. And my personal favorite, we've all been talking about this behind the scenes, is we have your straws from UHA for Pauhana time. Now, we couldn't send you any liquor, sorry about that, <laughs> but we wanted to send you the straw to help you drink quicker and also to be more environmentally conscious. And yes, it did come with a cleaner as well. So that's great. All right. Now next up, since we are coming to you virtually and you're probably at home, um, you'll be pretty busy and we want to thank Fantagio where you can put this door hanger up to let, you, let them know whether or not you're available or if you're busy, which you're going to be busy for the next couple of hours, enjoying this wonderful conference. And if they don't leave you alone, you can throw this Prialto ball at them. And we're going to use this ball, so if you have it, keep it handy in a moment. <laughs> and last but not least, in your, it's not in your swag box, but it is available at the end of the day after you complete your survey. You can download the best-selling book from our keynote speaker, Maya Hu Chan. And so I've got a copy right here. And speaking of Maya, she is here now, and she is ready to kick off our conference. I'm excited. I know you guys are too. So Maya is the founder of Global Leadership Associates, an international management consulting firm. With a reputation for excellence in executive coaching, global leadership, inclusion, and cross-cultural management. She's a regular columnist for Inc. Magazine, an author of the best-selling book, Saving Face, How to Preserve Dignity and Build Trust. 
This book fits perfectly with our theme of honoring relationships. Today, she will lead us on a journey to discover how the universal concept of face today can transcend workplace dynamic beyond culture, geography, and technology. Born and raised in Taiwan, Maya was an anchor for the China Broadcasting Company, then earned a master's from the University of Pennsylvania. She lives in San Diego with her husband and three children. When Maya first came to the U.S., she used her Chinese name, Hu Meng Zheng. But most Americans, rather than trying to learn it, just ignored her. You can imagine how alone and isolated she also felt. So she changed her name to Maya. After that, people started to acknowledge her existence. She wrote recently, quote, I'm glad I adopted the name Maya, which means life is a dream. However, I still keep Mun Jung as my middle name, and I appreciate it when people learn my Chinese name and honor my heritage. At this time, please welcome our keynote speaker, Hu Meng Jun, also known as Maya Hu Chan. Thank you. Wow, this is the first time actually people introduce me using my Chinese name. Thank you, and you pronounce it perfectly, Elena. Thank you. Thank you. Aloha, everybody. Um, really excited to be here. I want to meet. I want you to meet Zhang. Zhang is a global manager working for a global supply chain company. He uh, told me about this incident that happened recently, that a few weeks ago, he sent an email to his global team member. And he actually has, a, he manages this global team that located in the US and Asia and Europe, all over the world. So he sent this email to his uh, direct report in Japan. And the email was very simple that he actually asked his team member to accomplish this one task at a certain specific time. So he sent this email out and asked the team member to respond and to confirm everything. 24 hours later, he got this email back. Just two words in the email, no way. <laughs> well, John was not impressed. In fact, he was annoyed and upset. The first thing popped into his head was, what, no way? How can you say something to you, to me like this? I'm your boss, how rude, right? So he immediately started writing an angry email back. He started typing this email, and as soon as he finished the email, right before he hit the send button, he read his email again. And then he thought about, well, this team member in Japan has been with me, with this team for almost a year. He's always working hard, and he's always very polite and respectful. I wonder why he would send some email like this to me. So instead of sending this email out, he decided to pick up a phone and talk to him. And he got this team member on the phone, and then he asked him, well, tell me about this project. What, what happened? Tell me what's going on. And this team member was very apologetic. He said, well, boss, boss, I, I want to explain to you, well, you know, uh, this deadline you gave me for this project was actually not a good time because I have two other projects. It's also due at the same week. I just cannot possibly do all three at the same week. So well, then he went on and explained the other two deadlines and what he was supposed to do and uh, um, in details, right? So John listened and he said, okay, well, makes sense. Um, that's fine, we can postpone this project by a week, that's not a problem. But why did you write the email, no way? And why didn't you explain all of this on the email to me? And this team member said, well, you know, my English is not very good. If you want me to explain this in email, it's gonna take me an hour. <laughs> and I don't have the time for this. Oh, and by the way, you know, I really wanted to improve my English. So I've been watching a lot of American movies and TV shows, and uh, people, I, I wanna learn to talk like Americans, right? And then so people say, no way, all the time. I thought, okay, I'm gonna practice this. So that's why I responded, to, is that okay? <laughs> and John, of course, then explained to him why no way is not appropriate in the business communication. And they both had a big laugh afterwards. Well, so think about this for a second, right? What happened 
if John didn't stop and think about this before he sent this email, or actually what happened if he actually sent the email out? What would happen to his relationship with this team member? Okay. And what was his initial assumption about the intention of the sender of the email? Okay. So when we face difficult conversations like this, it can happen to anybody. Okay. It can be someone that, that you work with, or it can be your family member, it could be your people in the community. And it can be your direct reports in a different country, or it can be somebody right here at home. Right? Because people have different communication styles, different perspectives, that when we face those kind of tough conversations, we need to, much like driving, we need to turn off the autopilot. Right? Stop, think before we act. And this way we can engage in a much more productive and constructive conversation and create a better work for a place and hopefully a better world. So I'd like to hear from you. Let's run a poll. Brandon, um, are we ready? So um, think about what type of conversation do you find most challenging at work? Okay, so choose one that you think is the most challenging. Is it giving negative feedback? Admit your own mistakes? Recognize others' achievements? Delivering the company's directions or change in plans? Set expectations? Defend my actions or ideas? Or COVID vaccination? What do you find most difficult? Hey. Got a lot of responses coming in. Keep them coming, folks. Okay, so I see a lot of people are voting. Uh, this is a, like a horse racing, <laughs> okay, see? <laughs> okay, which one actually get the most vote? All right. Brendan, can you let us know when uh, we're ready to close the poll? Let's give everybody maybe another three to five seconds. Yep, we're just hitting 85%, so real high participation. All right, ready to show those results? Okay, let's go ahead and close the poll and let's take a look at the results. Right, so um, looks like 58% of you says give negative feedback. That is the one that gets the most vote. And uh, followed by um, COVID vaccination. This is definitely something new that has happened in the last year and a half. It is a tough conversation. And 12% say defend your actions or ideas and also deliver company actions, directions and change in plans. Absolutely. Well, so um, when I actually did the survey with some of you actually prior to the conference, the result is actually quite similar. Um, about between 40 to 50% of you mentioned giving negative feedback about somebody's performance was actually most challenging and most uncomfortable for you. Now, so go ahead and let's close the poll. Thank you, Brandon. Now, so when we look at um, the research have shown that two thirds, actually it's more than that, it's 69% of the managers in the US find it very uncomfortable to communicate with their employees just in general, okay? And then almost 40% think that giving direct feedback or criticism about their performance is something that's most challenging for leaders. So what makes giving feedback so difficult and why is it so challenging for some of us okay and uh, i think cultural has something to do with it okay now here in hawaii that we are heavily influenced by asian culture okay so um you know 42 percent of our workforce is actually asian or asian descent and asian cultural actually has some very unique characteristics that can really impact how we work and how we communicate with people. Okay, so there are three key elements I would like to share with you today. The first one, and those three, by the way, are all interconnected. <laughs> one feeds into another. So the first one is relationship and the indirect communication, and the third one is face. So let's talk about relationship, okay? Well, Relationship is so important in Asian culture. 
particularly in, uh, in Hawaiian culture, that we value relationship. And we wanted to take the time to cultivate and nurture the relationship. Relationship comes first, usually, and then the task comes in second, okay? If I feel comfortable with you, if I, am, if I trust you, okay, and uh, we have a positive relationship, then people feel much more comfortable actually working, collaborating together. And we take the time to cultivate this relationship and trust. And once we build the trust, we want to make sure that we maintain this relationship. So we want to be liked. We also wanted to make sure that this relationship can last a long time. We don't want to do anything to harm it. Okay, so relationship is really essential for Asian culture. Now, we also tend to, because we wanted to preserve relationship and preserve harmony, that we tend to take a more indirect approach in our communication. What happened is that we would um, typically not uh, uh, try to avoid using the word no in our communication, okay? And then we tend to be made much more subtle. And uh, so, well, because we think that saying no is uh, almost a sign of disrespect. And is how we, it shows that we, we, uh, we challenge the other person. And so when we um, don't want to say the word no, but we really disagree with somebody, what do we say? What have you thought about? Well, you know, if, if you don't want to say no, what do you say instead? Okay, so what I've noticed, and you probably have a lot of different examples in your head, right? Is that either people remain silent, they don't say anything if they disagree, or they say yes, but. And one of the most confusing and common expression that I have heard is that people say, well, I'll try my best, okay? so. Well, I have worked with leaders all over the world, and when I actually work with people uh, with Asian backgrounds, when they think about this expression versus the Western cultural, they have a very different interpretation of that. So when I ask people in the Western cultural, what do you think I would try my best mean? People usually say, well, it's about, well, 80 or 90% chance somebody, something is gonna happen. They're gonna do something. If they say, I will try my best, that's pretty good, what else can I ask for, right? But when I ask someone from the Asian background, they say, well, it's more like a 10%, right? Because they're being so polite, they don't want it to uh, 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 be so direct. And so when they say, I will try my best, 90% versus 10%, very big gap, big difference in terms of how people interpret this expression. Recently, my colleague um, from Malaysia told me that we have a saying that Today is not a good day to say yes. <laughs> so what does that mean? If today is not a good day to say yes, then I guess it's a no, right? But they won't use the word no. So indirect communication is a very common um, way of communicating uh, with the Asian background. Now, the third key element is face. So let's talk about face. What is face? Face represents a person's self-esteem, self-worth, identity, reputation, pride, and dignity. That's a lot, right? That represent how you see yourself and how others perceive you. So it's inside out and outside in. Face is a universal concept that goes beyond its origin of Asia. So when we think about face, it really permeates all the social and business interactions. Okay, and well, let's face is actually the social currency in today's world. So what do I mean by that? Okay? The more face you have, the easier and faster you can get things done. Okay, so well, imagine that you are building a supply of face, okay, with someone by continuously making deposit in this relationship account, okay? You keep your promise, you build trust, you show appreciation and gratitude towards the other person, you listen to them, you demonstrate empathy, you put yourself in their shoes, okay? And you provide feedback 
in a way that doesn't cause them to lose face. Okay? And you continuously making that deposit in your daily interaction with this person. Okay? And when someday that you are actually need to make a withdrawal, okay? you need to provide a negative feedback to this person, that the relationships can still be saved if you have enough deposit in this bank account. I like to call this overdraft protection. <laughs> now, so there are three key concepts of face. Okay, the first one is about honoring face. So what is honoring face? Honoring face is that you take actions to show respect, admiration to the, to, for the other person. And it's not a rocket science. You're probably already doing that already. Okay, so now, I'd love to hear how you honor face for others. Okay, so go ahead and type in your chat box. Um, let me know how do you do it. And also, how do other people honor your face in your professional and personal relationships? Give me some examples. Okay. And we'd love to, um, Bernard, if you can um, read out some of the, the comments in the chat box. Love to hear from your, your, and your direct experience. We have a couple of things coming in. Being authentic and listen. Mm -hmm. Taking time to listen and understand their perspective. Asking for opinions, asking for feedback rather than telling and giving orders. Right. I love that. Listening sounds like a really important element, right? And listening is how you demonstrate you respect the other person. Their opinion matters, okay? So when you honor somebody's face, that is that you, you show that you listen and you see them and they matter. Okay, one of the, my favorite quote is from Maya Angelou. She said that people will forget what you do, what you did. People will forget what you said, but people will never forget how you make them feel. Okay, so that's honoring face. Now the second concept is losing face and that's something we wanted to avoid. Okay, so losing face describe conditions that people feel devalued, unappreciated, disrespected, or even humiliated. So I have, um, you know, as you know, I grew up in Taiwan. And when I grew up, my parents and teachers often quote this ancient proverb, Chinese proverb, Fu Shui Nan Shou. Uh, the translation is that spilled water is hard to regain. Okay, so imagine that you accidentally knock over a glass of water on the table. Now you spill water all over the floor. Okay. Is it, how hard is it to put it all back in the glass? Nearly impossible, right? Now even if you manage to put some back in the glass, do you still want to drink it? <laughs> I don't think so. Right? So this proverb reminds us that whatever is said and done, just, you just can't take it back. Just like spilled water is hard to regain, you can't take it back. So when we cause somebody to lose face, that you can provoke a wide range of negative emotions, such as fear, humiliation, frustration, and all, right, all, all kinds of emotions. Now, when people feel that they lost face, this can directly impact how they perform and how much they are you know, engaged at work, how much they actually share their ideas at meetings and how often they speak up and even impact how long they stay with the company. Okay. And people may not actually say, oh, I lost face at work. They may not actually use this phrase, but you hear people say this all the time. You know, my boss doesn't appreciate what I do. Or, you know, that other people don't really care what I say, and my opinion is not heard. Or I'm not invited to some of the important meetings. I don't know what's going on. So when you hear those kind of expressions, that often means that people feel they're not being included, and they're trying to fit in, but they don't really belong, okay? And sometimes we can cause people to lose face unintentionally, okay? For example, sometimes we may, 
give a feedback to somebody in, in public without thinking if this is the right place and right time for me to provide this negative feedback. Or sometimes that we can um, criticize or disagree or challenge somebody in public, or we crack insensitive jokes. We put somebody down in a very subtle way. All of those microaggression can cause people to lose face that you didn't mean it, okay? But the impact is really negative for the other person. Now, so, you know, respect and job performance are directly linked. Now, this research from McKinsey, um, did, they, did, they did a research for 800 managers in 17 different industries to understand what does the respect have to do with job performance. The research result shows that nearly half of those who feel like they're being treated poorly deliberately decrease their time at work. Nearly half of them. 38% said they intentionally decrease the quality of their work. 66%, two-thirds of them, said that their, their performance actually gotten worse. And this is scary. 80% said that their commitment to the organization has declined. They're more likely to leave the company because they don't feel respected. Okay. So now, that takes us to the third concept of face, is saving face. Saving face is the authentic and intentional act of turning a situation around that potentially can be embarrassing or damaging to the other person. And we take the action to turn things around to prevent the loss of respect and dignity so that everybody will, 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 will turn out to feel like they, they, they have, there's a positive outcome and preserve dignity for everybody involved. So let me give you an uh, example, a true story. Now, Jeff is a finance director for a international uh, investment bank. Now, he is facing a big crisis. Under his watch, now he actually designed and deployed a, a, a cash flow process and system that allowed a frontline employee to steal $100,000 in an eight month period. So when, uh, when this happened, John felt personally responsible for this, but also personally victimized. Okay, and this topic was actually discussed not only at the security meetings in the company, but also the rumors spread all over the company. Everybody knew about it. Okay, so it's a pretty big deal. And also, it's a good example of losing face big time. So um, the company's COO uh, decided to meet with Jeff and his team. And for days that you can tell, Jeff lost weight. He couldn't sleep for days. He had even developed this rash all over his face. He was so anxious and so nervous and stressed out. Okay? And so at the day of the meeting, Jeff and his team sit at the conference room, waiting for the COO to arrive. And the COO walk in. He broke the tension with just one sentence. He said, I don't care about the theft. Then he continued. He said, theft is unavoidable. Whether you're running a hot dog stand or a multinational company, our company is insured so we will be made whole. And I will only want to know that you're going to review the process and fix it. And from where I can see, or from what I can see, you're well on your way, Jeff. So Jeff's demeanor completely brightened, immediately changed. You can tell physically, his physical reaction, his facial expression, he was completely relaxed and feel relieved. And then at the same time, he refocuses energy with his team for the rest of the meeting, focusing on solving the problem and move forward. And then he went back to work with this renewed energy. The COO had saved his face. So how did the COO do it? So he was um, kind and firm at the same time. He created psychological safety, yet 
still holding Jeff accountable. He didn't let him off the hook, okay? And he chose his words carefully, okay? So he demonstrated humility and emotional intelligence to deal with this very delicate situation. He was able to help Jeff overcome shame and embarrassment, and then to help him refocus on solving the problem and moving forward. He sent a very clear message to Jeff and his team. I trust you. I know, I believe you will do the right thing. And that is saving face. So um, there are, uh, you know, saving face and uh, having a tough conversation with dignity is a real art, right? And it, it's not something that, that could happen automatically, particularly uh, it doesn't happen if you're on autopilot. So it requires intentionality and mindfulness on the leader side. So I wanted to share with you a model, it's called build model. Okay, build model represents five steps. Okay, and B represents benevolence and accountability. Okay, and U is understanding. Okay, I means interacting. Okay, L means learning. And D is delivery. Okay, so those are the five steps. So let's start with B. So benevolence, this is a big word, right? So benevolence means kindness, okay? Benevolence also means that um, empathy and uh, being able to demonstrate that you put yourself in the other person's shoes, that you give the other person the benefit of the doubt. So when you're thinking about benevolence, it's that when you communicate with the other person, the other person knows that you have their back. Okay, so um, when we think about the benevolence, this actually is a foundation of having tough conversations with dignity. Okay, now you provide an environment of psychological safety because the other person knows that you're not going to publicly humiliate me and embarrass me you have my best interest in mind. So benevolence is what Jeff did, that being kind yet firm at the same time. So this particular step, I added accountability as part of the equation. So you can't just have benevolence without accountability. You have to have both. If too much of a benevolence, and then people feel too comfortable because there's no consequence, why should I do anything, right? But what happens if you have all accountability, but there's no benevolence? What happens? People tend to feel too much anxious. They add anxiety, and they feel like they constantly have to defend themselves. There is a threat at work. So what is the fine balance here, right? To be able to build a psychological safety at the same time that holding people accountable. Now, so uh, let's talk a little bit about psychological safety. In 2012, Google embarked a, uh, a, a special project. It's called Project Aristotle. And many of you probably heard of it, okay? So this particular project um, is for the researchers to understand, to answer this very simple question. The question is that, what makes a team great? It's not just good, but great. What makes a team great? Now, so the researchers studied 180 different teams all over the world. And then they made a lot of hypotheses. Is it um, because the, the educational background of the team members that made the team great? It said their cultural background, personality types, genders, generations, age groups, they, they, they test all those hypotheses. But it, at the end, they find out that none of those factors are the key differentiators. Then the number one factor to make a team great is called psychological safety. Okay, so what is it? What is psychological safety? It's a shared belief held by members of the team that the team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. And so the psychological safety is a sense of confidence 
that the team will not embarrass, reject, or punish somebody for speaking up. So they feel safe in the team environment. So when you think about psychological safety, you may ask, well, so Maya, what is the behavior, right? <laughs> How do you know that, what kind of behavior do we need to demonstrate to build this culture of psychological safety? So Google's research team identified two very specific behaviors. The first behavior has to do with conversation turn-taking. So what that means is that when you're in a, in a team meeting or a team um, a, a environment, that every team member take about roughly equal amount of time to speak. So you don't have one or two people that just dominate a conversation, okay? And then the rest kind of just listen and, and be quiet. So everybody have a rough, roughly same amount of time to speak and share their thoughts. And at the same time, at the end of the, at the, end of the meeting, people feel like they have said what they wanna say. Nobody hold back. Okay, so that's the first factor a behavior is conversation turn-taking. The second behavior is called a high social sensitivity. Okay. So people at the team, at a very high performing team, they pay attention to their team members. Okay. They watch verbal, nonverbal cues of their team members. Whatever they say, and then they watch for the reactions. So they're very, very much tuned in to the team members reactions and their, their, their psychological uh, uh, expression and feelings about how they react to certain comments. So those social sensitivity has to do with empathy, okay? And then also the, the first part about conversational turn-taking is all about how they communicate with each other. Okay, so now psychological safety is so important when it comes to having tough conversations with dignity. Okay, that's the foundation, that's the, that's the backdrop that for people to be, able, to be able to really truly open up and listen to feedback. What happens when you don't feel safe? Okay. Typically, we all heard there are three typical reactions, right? They either fight or flight or freeze. So one of the most common reactions uh, for in a workplace is actually the third one, freeze. So when people don't feel safe, they stop talking altogether. They become very quiet, they become more reserved, and sometimes they even disengage and check out. Okay. And this can be very damaging in a team environment because people are not fully engaged in making the contribution for the team's success. And it's all because they don't feel safe to speak up. So on the other side, what happens when you feel safe? It's a completely different picture, right? When people feel safe, they tend to laugh more. They will crack more jokes, they use humor more, and they listen to each other, they feel they're being heard, okay? And they're more relaxed. And also, when, they, when people feel safe, that there is a very different way that people will show up at work. When, they, when people feel safe, they tend to um, take more risk, okay? And then they also tend to be more productive. They're more creative and they're more innovative because they're so relaxed, the ideas can flow so that they, are, they, they, they focus more their energy on how to solve the problem, how to accomplish our work goals and the team goals rather than self-protection. So that's a, that's a big difference between someone in a psychologically safe environment versus unsafe. All right, so now, that's the first step, benevolence and accountability. Now the second step is understanding, okay? So when we think about understanding, is that we wanted to start by, uh, from a place of curiosity and respect when we are having a conversation with someone particularly if it's a tough conversation. Now think about people like to be understood and want to be heard, right? The earlier we talked about that, you know, when people don't feel heard, that they actually that Im impact their job performance. So if you wanted to understand somebody, first by starting with questions, okay? And ask open-ended questions and avoid leading questions. So what kind of open-ended questions 
are we talking about? Right? Open-ended questions sounds like, hey, Agnes, how, how does this impact you? Okay? Or James, what is at stake for you? Okay. Or um, Alina, what kind of, what, what, what uh, would be helpful to get us on the same page? Okay, so ask those open-ended questions. Start with the word, WH words, like the what and how and why and who and when. So open-ended questions really open up the dialogue and allow the other person to share their thoughts and perspectives. So then you can understand them better. Now, avoid leading questions. What does the leading question sound like? Well, James, you, you don't want to be perceived as difficult, do you? <laughs> How does that sound to you, right? <laughs> um, a client of mine recently shared with me that her boss said something to her like this. Well, um, Jenny, you don't want to fail, do you? What kind of question is that, right? And so avoid leading questions and really think about what kind of question that can create psychological safety and then truly invite the other person to share with you so you can build better understanding. Now, oh. after you ask the question, what do you do next? You gotta listen, right? So um, I'm always rem reminded of this Chinese character, Ting, it means listening. Okay, look at this character here. It's, it's a very complicated, it's a, this is a uh, uh, traditional Chinese character that has many different parts. But this listening, this word, uh, shows that in order to listen well, you have to use one ear, 10 eyes, and one heart. You have to listen with the, your whole being, right? Not just with your ears. So one ear, 10 eyes, one heart. So listen with all of those. You're, you're, you pay full attention, be fully present. That is truly listen. Now, so that's the second step about understanding. Now, let's um, do another poll, Brandon. If you can um, uh, launch this poll here. So everybody, take a, take a guess. What percentage of employees think their opinions matter at work? Is it 10%? 30%, 50%, or 75%? Okay. Okay, so I see that uh, many of you are voting, and uh, we definitely have a clear winner here. So I'm going to give you another three seconds <laughs> to cast your vote. All right, Brandon, Brandon, how many people have voted? Can you see? Oh, it looks like 81%. Okay, I think we can close the poll. All right, so as you can see here, 46% of you voted 30%, and that is the correct answer. Okay, that's the correct answer. And this is the research that, go ahead and close the poll, please, Brandon. Thank you so much. So only 30% of US employees think their opinions matter at work. And this is according to the Gallup research. Okay, 30%, only 30%. So what happened to the other 70%? Right? If you don't feel like you're being heard or people don't care about what you have to say, how likely are you going to make the full contribution at work? Okay, so that's why listening and truly understand their thoughts and opinions really matters. Now, let's talk about the third letter, I. Okay, I is interacting. What does interacting mean? Now, when you're interacting with the other person, particularly it's a tough situation, it's a sensitive situation that you wanted to raise your human antenna. So do you remember the old-fashioned radio? 
that I am old enough to remember that, right? <laughs> now, so the, the, the old-fashioned radio is that you have those antenna. You have to actually raise it in order to hear things. What happened when the antenna is down? You can't hear anything, right? There was nothing, or you can hear a little bit of static, but you can't hear what's going on on the radio. But when you raise the antenna all the way up, all of a sudden, everything becomes so clear, right? You can collect, you can get, receive all kinds of signals from all different directions, okay? And the, the music, the playing in the radio, or the, the, the people talking become very, very clear. What happened is that with human being, we need to do the same thing, right? So when we're interacting with people, that we don't want to just oh, go with the flow and uh, you know, go with the autopilot, but rather, let's make sure that we raise this invisible human antenna to really listen and pay attention when we're interacting. Now, when you're interacting, it's also important to state your intention, okay, clearly and repeatedly. What I mean by that is that people usually don't feel that, uh, if somebody is having a tough conversation with them, that if, if they don't know your intention, a lot of time they will assume the worst. Okay, so state your intention with people clearly and sometimes you have to say it more than once. So let me give you an example, okay? Um, when you're in a, in a meeting and you wanted to generate some real uh, um, opinion or feedback, you can say, my intention for this meeting is that I would like to hear all of your concerns. Let's put it all out on the table so that we can make sure we are not missing anything. Okay, so that's your intention. Another example that I would like to, um, I would really like your help to make sure that we deliver this feedback, we deliver this project on time. That's my intention for this conversation. Okay, and you can also, when you're in a meeting situation, to talk about your intention in terms of how you create, you want to create um, a, a, a cultural or environment that people can contribute. You can say something like, Agnes, you know, um, I would like to uh, uh, really be open to all the different feedback and also all your different perspectives. So if I slipped, would you remind me? Okay, so you state your intention clearly and repeatedly. And people don't have to guess, what, what, why are we having this conversation? Okay, now, the third point is to learn your A, B, C, D. <laughs> so what does that mean? Now, A means avoid. Avoid those three things when you're in a tough conversation. Avoid blame, avoid contempt, avoid defensiveness. That's B, C, D. Okay, let me repeat. Avoid blame. Contempt, defensiveness. So it's, it's very easy to fall into the trap of blaming people or pointing fingers when it comes to a tough situ situation that people, are, things are not going well. If you started to realize that you are actually demonstrating one of those behaviors, okay, quickly refocus yourself into focusing on moving the conversation forward and focus on the future. Now, if, uh, and, and also work with your team to review those behaviors to help people uh, um, kind of get on the same page to say, let's, let's make sure that we avoid those behaviors so that uh, we can hold each other accountable. So we will have a co productive, constructive conversation. Now, now, let's move on to L, learning. Okay, so learning has to do with two things. Okay, there's a Zen master once said, that in a beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. But in an expert's mind, what happened? There is none. So always um, uh, keep a beginner's mind when we're having a conversation, a tough conversation with someone, to think about what do I not know? And we don't know what we don't know. Okay? And sometimes that, uh, that's the really good place to start. So have a beginner's mind, and continue to learn, and also take a helicopter view, okay? What I mean by that is that let's play a mental trick to think about if I'm on the helicopter watching this whole situation, 
whether it's a conflict or it's a dilemma. What do I see from the helicopter view? Okay, I'm not no longer involved in the situation. I can be more objective and I can see the dynamics of the different players, the stakeholders, and also I have a much bigger perspective of what's happening and I can learn better. Now, so the last piece, last step is delivery, right? So the de delivery is to bring, bring all of the steps together, okay? And then to actually have this conversation with somebody with dignity. The first thing, it's about using straight talk. Now, so straight talk is defined as say what has to be said to the right person at the right place at the right time. Accurately, clearly, and respectfully. That's straight talk, okay? And straight talk is different than blunt talk. It's also different than safe talk. So in the, um, in the next workshop that we're gonna do in about an hour, that we're gonna actually take a deep dive into what does the straight talk look like? And how can I use this in my daily conversation with people? Okay, so delivery part is number one, use straight talk. The second thing is to honor and save face for people, okay? And always think about what can I do to continue to build up this um, face account so that I can actually be able to continue to build trust and then also save face for others when there's a potential conflict. And remember, HR means honoring relationships, right? And then so when you're making the delivery of those conversations to continue to have those mindset. Now, I would like to uh, um, wrap up my, my, my talk with, uh, um, with a question for you, okay? So have you all heard of the golden rule? What is the golden rule? Golden rule is that you, are, um, you treat others as you would like to be treated, right? Now, I would like to take it up a notch when it comes to dealing with tough situations, okay? So I call that platinum rule. And there's only one word difference. What is the difference here? Platinum rule is treat others as they would like to be treated. Okay, thank you very much. Now, I would love to hear some questions if uh, we have a few minutes left. Um, any questions that, um, please feel free to type in the chat box. And Bernard? You'll be able to um, uh, read the questions and uh, love to hear your thoughts. Any questions, Bernard? Nothing in the chat box yet. So if anyone has questions, feel free to type it in the chat box. Yes, absolutely. Lorraine, we have actually some live audience here in the group. So, yes, Lorraine. Good morning, and thank you so much. Um, really great takeaways about allowing people to save face and having these, co these tough conversations with dignity. Could you speak, you touched upon it, but could you speak for a little bit more about when you're trying hard to do that, but the person that you're talking to is not playing well, and how you don't let yourself get drug, into, drug down in the dirt by that? Yes. Okay, so let me repeat the question. Great question, Lorraine. So yes, when I'm trying to engage with somebody, right, and to have this tough conversation, and if some, the other person does not play well, right? <laughs> um, can you give me an example, Lorraine, about when they don't play well, what does that mean to you? What does that look like? What does it look like, gosh, it's hard. Um, I think what happens is that I personally, will, if the person repeatedly continues yeah. to be on the attack and rude and not being respectful of mm -hmm. me, I, I lose my patience and I risk devolving into then, then not behaving well myself. Yes, absolutely. So the other person continue to demonstrate aggression, exactly. for example, yes. or they perhaps shut down. And you know, it just, we're not really engaging in this conversation. What do you do? Right now, I would say go back to, <clears throat> and this kind of situation can happen when people either feel unsafe, 
that they need to defend themselves, they need to defend their positions, or they feel like they were right, right? And they really wanted to make a point of that. So um, going back to the build model, okay? And then to think about what is happening from their point of view. Because sometimes that people really want to be heard. They don't feel like they're being understood. So being able to ask some of the open-ended questions. And when we truly listen deeply, okay, and people will feel less of a need to fight you. Okay? So ask them, hear them out. Say, oh, so what does that feel like for you? Okay? And please share your perspective. And then once you listen to it, here's a very important technique that I actually have learned over the years as executive coach, is to actually mirroring back to what they're saying so that the other person feel like they're being heard. So some of the key words that you can repeat back to the other person and then to help them see that what are some of the things that they really truly feel it's important and then repeat back some of the key words. And don't paraphrase, to actually use those words, right? And then so hopefully they will be able to um, relax and then kind of being able to engage with you in a conversation that actually can move the conversation forward. Okay, yeah, you're very welcome. And- I've had a couple more questions come in. Excellent. So one of them, um, once you lose face, how, how can you work to regain it? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, right? <laughs> like, when you knock over a glass of water, water spill over, it's hard to put it all back. So, you know, once you lose face, how do you regain it? And I'm gonna actually share a story with you um, that, uh, that it's a true story, my client, Linda. Linda is, is a global manager, and then because during COVID, she did a lot of the uh, virtual communication with her team that are spread out. So um, one of her, um, the, 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 the management style that she's most proud, most proud of was that she's very straightforward. She's very direct. And uh, she's also very, very efficient. So she's been using this uh, platform, it's called Slack, to communicate with her team members. You, many of you are nodding your head, right? So um, she, at first she was using that to share information and, and uh, project deadlines. And then after a while, she, she started to provide feedback on Slack. And then so people start to read all this direct feedback about certain team members. They're missing their deadlines and something was wrong with the report. And all of a sudden her team start to disengage. They're not sharing their ideas and they're not speaking up. Okay, so I st when I started working with her that I did a 360 interview to find out what's happening. The team performance has actually tanked. So the feedback came back that people were feeling unsafe, okay? They feel like when they read those feedback, even though they're, it's not directly towards themselves, they saw other team members being uh, you know, criticized and they mentally made a no for themselves. It's like, I don't be, want to be in that shoes. So they start to protect themselves. And so as soon as I shared that with Linda, Linda realized that this is actually her blind spot that she didn't mean to cause people to lose face, but that was unintended consequence. So that she started immediately change the way she uh, operate and communicate with her team members. And she started to take negative feedback offline. And she has more one-on-ones with her team members to build trust. Okay. And then she also apologized to people about some of the things that she said or, uh, she said or did. And then so over time, that it takes time. Once you, you know, the, the question is that once you cause somebody to lose face, it's very hard to rebuild. It takes a long time to get it all back. Okay, so she continued to work on that consistently and diligently. And finally, after six months, we did another survey that things are gotten so much better because people start to believe. And then they saw the proof in her actions. So, it's that overdraft protection that you start to do. And if you actually accidentally overdraft, there's no deposit in your bank account that you need to start making that deposit, right? 
And so it, it is definitely possible to, to rebuild this relationship and trust, but it's really important for leaders to keep in mind that, you know, my actions actually has a serious consequence. So we're not going to be on the autopilot. Yeah. We have more questions? Yes, Maya, do you have any mm -hmm. tips on having difficult conversations in a virtual work environment when you're not face to face with the person? Yes. You know, actually, as um, uh, uh, several, quite a few leaders, we're, uh, we have all been in a virtual environment, um, particularly in the last year and a half, close to two years now, right? And it is hard to, to, to build connections and relationship and trust in a virtual environment. So I would have, I have two suggestions, okay, and that they seem to work quite well um, in a virtual environment. Number one is that have more one-on-ones, more frequent contact with your, with your team members. Even you can't see them face to face because you don't have those water cooler conversations anymore, right? And you miss those opportunities. So make a point to connect with people and it doesn't have to be all about work, okay? You can either text them or just to check in with them to say how you're doing, if you have heard that somebody in the family got sick or they're not feeling well or something is going on, just simply check in with them and touch base with them or have more one-on-ones with people. And leaders take, the, they take that uh, the initiative to reach out to their team members and then to start having those frequent touch points. They tend to build much stronger trust with people. So, Frequency of the connection of the contact is more important than the duration. So you don't have to schedule an hour long meeting once a month with your employees if you have frequent checkpoints with them and just continue to reach out and make those connections. Okay. And uh, um, another thing that many leaders share with me is that because we're on the Zoom so much that you lose those, uh, you know, in the past when people meet face to face, that at the first five minutes, usually it's sort of, hey, what did you do last weekend? Hey, let's talk about the ball game. Well, what happened? And how was your vacation? People check in with each other and crack jokes and before the actual meeting starts. But people, know, people notice that during the Zoom uh, meetings, usually as soon as the, the people log in, they start talking business. So this gives people very little time to really make that connection. Okay, so I would suggest and recommend that when you schedule those Zoom meetings, that make a deliberate effort to have some touch point at the beginning, just check in with everyone, okay? And the leader needs to initiate that. So you, the team actually feel like there is some connections beyond just jump in and start talking about business, okay? And those are a couple things that I think can be quite practical for leaders' practice. I have a tricky question for you. Oh, I like tricky questions. All right, <laughs> so what are some tips to help support a person who has to have a difficult conversation with someone, but the person who needs to lead the conversation is the one who does not feel psychologically safe with the person they need to confront? Okay, all right, so how do you support somebody like that, right? Yes. Is that a question? Um, actually, as an executive coach, I have to do this a lot as the coach to help my client. Uh, most of the time, this conversation happens is my client has to um, confront their, their boss. A lot of times, they don't feel comfortable to have those direct conversation, okay? And so, um, typically, when this kind of situation happens, you can't just wing it. Okay, it does require a lot of preparation. I like to think about there are two things, two Ps, that you can support somebody. And then also, if you are the person that needs to deliver a tough conversation and something that you can do for yourself, two Ps. The first P is prepare. Second P is practice. Okay, so prepare is that take out a piece of paper to really ask yourself this question. Number one, what is my goal of this conversation? 
be really clear. And a lot of times we don't actually think this through when we enter a conversation that's, that's challenging. So what do I want to accomplish in this conversation, number one? And what might the other person say? Okay. And then what do I want to respond? Okay. And the last question to ask yourself is that, what is the plan B? Okay, what is the consequence? What's the plan B? And if the other person is unwilling to engage with me, or they don't agree with what, where I'm going with this, then what is my plan B? So that's the preparation, okay? Number one, again, is to ask yourself, what is my goal? What the other person might say, and what would I say? And then how am I going to respond if the person is unwilling to respond to, to work with me. Preparation is key here. You can write it all down and then kind of, kind of uh, prepare yourself for this conversation. And then the second step is practice. Now, this is when you can actually support the other person. If you are a coach or if you are a coworker or if, you, if your husband or wife or friend needs your support or a coworker to say, let's practice, let's rehearse this conversation. Just say it out loud and, and then you can provide feedback to the other person and say, this is how it sounds to me. You sound really defensive or um, perhaps this is too subtle. So think about how you might um, provide some really concrete feedback, constructive feedback for the other person. And once they are uh, well prepared and then they practice with you, then they're better equipped to have a productive conversation. So two piece.